we have stumbled upon the fact that yes, the oral microbiome, the oral gateway is essential. And probably the nasal microbiome gateway, having a good one is essential to your health, period. If you don't fix these airway problem, you have neurocognitive changes that don't go away. You gotta fix it by age six, seven. Here we got something we use in the mouth all the time, xylitol, right? We use it all the time in the mouth. We know it inhibits oral cancer cell lines. That's well published. You're not just treating gum disease. You're not just treating cavities. You're not just reducing Alzheimer's. You're not just reducing atherosclerosis. You're not just reducing diabetes and obesity. You're also affecting the metabolomics. Yeah, this is a tale. A tale, oh yeah. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one. Bringing the best of dental knowledge. And we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening. And preventing gum disease. We're gonna do a lot of learning. And have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. A tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode number 335. My name is Andrew, and thank you for making us a part of your day. We have such a great episode for you guys. Uh, Dr. Mark Cannon, returning to the podcast. Special thank you to Michelle Hudson for playing co-host again. She is, she is such a ray of sunshine, and I really enjoy the guests that she brings on. She brought Dr. Cannon on actually twice now, um, and we just recorded today some really good episodes with some of our other friends. So those are coming up in a few months. Uh, next week, we have a different kind of show again, where we talk to a hygienist who made the transition to sales. It was a wonderful episode with Kimberly Boggs Klein. And if you're looking at doing something similar, her story is a pretty good model that you're going to learn a lot of pros and cons and, and some other things. And so while we're bringing this episode, because I think it's, a, it's something that some of us need, I also want to state and be very clear that myself and the podcast, we've always had that firm belief that we need people to stay in the op. Um, but there are definitely circumstances where that's not always possible. So this is why we brought you that show. Um, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss next week's show if this is of interest to you. Uh, I also want to say congratulations to all the graduates this year and to all of those who have just passed your boards. I know it was a lot of work. But you did it. And we're looking forward to having you join us here in the offices. Be sure to reach out to us here at Tell to Hygienist if you have any questions or concerns at all. Um, we'd be more than happy to try and give you whatever answers or support that, that we can. My email address is andrew at a tale of two hygienist.com. And then the last thing I want to bring up is that we just recorded several great episodes today. We have a bunch of them coming out very soon. Uh, we have one on mindfulness, which that episode alone, I can listen to her voice all the time, but it blew me away about how great it was. And it's something that's definitely applicable to all of us. Uh, we have another episode on strength training and ergonomics. We have a, an episode coming out that's a round table about reinventing yourself and just a ton more coming up in the, the next couple of months. So please stay tuned for that. And then we will be recording a ton of episodes at RDH Under One Roof. Uh, so that'll always be exciting. Uh, so that's it for me. I hope everyone enjoys this episode with Dr. Mark Cannon and Michelle Hudson. A tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to the interview portion of the podcast. We're so excited today. We're joined by Dr. Mark Cannon again, a, re a returned guest, and we have Michelle Hudson on again. This is like a reunion of sort from Chicago Midwinter that I'm so excited about. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me back as a co-host and even more so, Dr. Cannon, thank you for coming back. I don't know about y'all, but I had so many text messages and emails about Dr. Cannon's interview the, mm -hmm. uh, during Chicago Midwinter, and it was all amazing feedback. We had hundreds more downloads on that episode compared to the ones before and after it. It was a huge spike, Doctor, for your episode. So you're very well beloved in the community for sure. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to be discussing all this with you. I, that's what I live for. I, I really want to help people understand that everything is a continuum. Mm -hmm. What we do 
is so important. And I was just lecturing in Mexico City. And I told them what I tell everyone when I have a live presentation. I look at that audience um, and you all listening. You are the most important people in health care right now. You have the biggest opportunity and the greatest responsibility in healthcare pretty much of all time because we now know definitively the many connections. We can't even say connections. We can't even be blasé and say links or associations. We have stumbled upon the fact that, yes, the oral microbiome, the oral gateway is essential. And probably the nasal microbiome gateway, having a good one is essential to your health, period. It's like when I jokingly say about the dermatologist finding out a few years ago that the skin is actually attached to the human body. And you can actually diagnose many skin pathologies just by looking at the, at, at the feces, looking at the gut microbiome, because it's very specific for things like acne. And the oral microbiome is very specific for things like psoriasis. Things that we had hints to, there's some great research going back to the 60s and 70s. We had great hints that they knew back then, for instance, with psoriasis, many people were also strep carriers. But we didn't know why. Now we have the why. And the mechanisms are fascinating. And to me, it's, it's like a beautiful landscape portrait where you're looking at all the different things that work together. In this portrait, you can look at the sky, the beautiful blue sky, the clouds, the sun, the lighting. You can see a family at the beach. You can see the waves coming in. You can see the beach itself. I realize just how, as Darwin said, all life is connected. Mm. All of our microbiomes are connected. So as you know, I have this lecture called Is Tropism Dead? And it's really kind of funny because we now realize that many of the microbes of the 39 trillion microbial organisms on us, they're so much part of us, they're actually within all of our cells. They control what's inside our cells. I can tell you so many things that were just like giant enlightenments that Things that happen in my mind when I am with this famous neuroscientist giving this uh, presentation at Northwestern, showing the sulfur vibrio, the sulfur cans in brain cells. And a researcher in diabetes was there. And she goes, I've seen that in pancreatic cells. I just thought they were artifacts, but that is a microorganism. Yes, it is. It's a microorganism that got into us from deep oil. Bacteria that was buried 100 million years ago, eating oil, now inside our brains and our pancreas and probably our liver and everything else. Everyone just thinks it's just an artifact. Isn't it hysterical? But now we're bringing everything together. And that is what's so important because just because it's there doesn't mean it's evil. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it, it does cause Gulf War syndrome, right? In our Iraqi war veterans, that's why they have Gulf War syndrome, is from inhaling those bacteria into their lungs. They got into the brain. They affect our behavior, but so many things affect our behavior. Yeah. Don't I, let me talk too much. It's, no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, all of this is really important. And I think that when we have someone like you that comes onto the podcast and gives, and, and in your lectures too, and you say, look, you guys are, front lines, you are important. I think that really gives us license to be able to step outside of our comfort zone. I had a, I had a hygienist just the other day and I was working with them one-on-one -on -one and, you know, it felt very mechanical and it felt very, there was no connection between that hygienist and their patient. I was trying to get them to open up about what is this patient need? What are the things that are causing these problems for this patient? And for a lot of us that have been in it for a little bit longer than this person has, we've, we're there. We're, we, we see that. But we don't have the license. Or we don't feel the ability to look at an artifact or look at something that's just in our periphery that's just different. Oh, it's different. It's fine. It's just different. It's fine. That we don't feel like we're allowed to examine that a little bit deeper. And so I'm glad that you bring that up because it's a really important part in what we do every day as, as clinicians. 
Absolutely. And you're so correct. And Michelle, you know this, that when you have that patient in the chair and you're performing this mechanical debridement, you're just removing surface stuff. I mean, porphyromonas gingivalis is inside all those gingival epithelial cells, as we joked before. How do you get the little tiny toothbrush down inside the cell? How do you get your scale or down deep into the dermis? Oh, you don't. So they're still there. So you have to use other mechanisms. The number one thing you have in your arsenal is education. Love that. Yeah, you educate. You're with the patient. Every time I I always see my my team members at the office, they're like staring at me like, move on, move on. You're talking too much again. You're move on. <laughs> You're giving the kids a history lesson at the same time. Yeah. Because, you know, again, we have to know where we have been before we know where we can go. And, and fortunately, as you know, we we, we have the, all the stuff from the hunter gatherers. We know what has happened. We know how we've evolved this way. And because we know how we have evolved, when we talk to people and you're talking about the importance of diet and exercise, because we need the exercise, we have to have exercise to have our normal microbiomes. Wow. I mean, we know from research that is true. You have to have the right diet. You have to change your diet. Eat seasonal things. Don't eat the same food all the time. Otherwise, you reduce the diversity of your microbiome and you cut away a lot of your defense mechanisms. Eat a lot of foods that are high in prebiotics. There's a lot of foods very high. All the healthy things, all the heart healthy stuff, they're all high in prebiotics. You go like, there's a hint. We got to see that. When we talk to patients, I explain to them all the stuff. And that's why... Like yesterday in the office, I had so many people left with probiotics, using prebiotics, and I can see the differences in their health. It also makes me kind of skeptical of a lot of research because we we see studies come out which look really, really good. They are later like disproved because a bunch of people do other research like disprove it, like the whole thing with vitamin C and sepsis controversy that's been going on. When you look at the doses in those follow-up studies, whoa, way low. Are they intentionally doing it way low? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me very surprising that you wouldn't use the same protocol exactly, that you would change doses. But right, So we can't always trust what we read. Shock. Shock. <laughs> well, I'm like, I can't believe it. We can't trust everything on the internet? Oh, no. Oh, no, you cannot trust it all. And so, as you know, for for years, one of the other things I've always told all my students is, you know, what I tell you today is wrong tomorrow and don't trust half the stuff you read because you'll find out later it's wrong. But sometimes the people saying it's wrong, are, they're wrong and the original stuff is right. So you always have to be kind of a skeptic in everything. But educate, educate, educate you're while you're there. Talk here. about recipes, but also mm -hmm. educate. Talk about what they're doing in sports, but also educate. Yes. Yes. Can I ask you a question about that? So will you kind of dive in a little bit deeper? So what, you know, what I coach to, and I, it's, it's AOSH, right? It's what we're trying to share with the world. And so much of what I educate to my patients is what you have taught me and so many others. So we look at uh, risk factors, perio, caries, function, physiologic, and then we really bring our patient into it and allow them to participate in every part of the process. They need to participate. What they're doing at home is even more important than what we're doing in our practices. And uh, I'm oh, yeah. and talking, you know, so many um, clinicians, healthcare providers will talk about, you know, tools to use. So electric toothbrushes, water flossers, flossing, etc. Very rarely are our healthcare providers comfortable talking all of those pillars of health, which include uh, what you were just talking about, exercise, but nutrition. And it is about more than just foods that cause decay. It's so much bigger than that. Will you talk to uh, us and share kind of how you walk through um, an appointment with the patient and then the research, get back to the research and how do we know if we're reading research that is beneficial, that's accurate, accurate? How do you evaluate that? 
Well, see, unfortunately, it's it's complicated when you look at patients because when you look at patients, you find patients who have many things. Like yesterday, I had a new patient, a young lady. I, the moment she sat in the chair, she still had her mask on, but I knew she had TMJ issues. And so immediately, uh, I'm looking, I do a full TMJ examination. She's 12. She's classic for beginning of TMJ. She also has airway issues, which go together. Now, airway issues go together with what? Oral microbiome issues, right? So many people have a shift in the oral microbiome because they're mouth breathers. I mean, that's something we see all the time too. Recently, from the Karen Bonnet stuff with sleep disturbed breathing, where we said that over 20% of kids have issues with airway, they we're now being told it's getting closer to 40%. So now we have a new big gorilla in the room. Now you got to talk about oral microbiome, sleep apnea, sleep disturbed breathing, sleep induced bruxism. You have to look at the narrow maxillas. You have to kind of go like, oh boy, what should I do in treatment of this patient? And you have to hit them on so many fronts. You can't do all of it in one appointment. Because you actually would be talking like me very rapidly and giving them so much information, <laughs> they cannot consume all of it. Yeah. They'll be hearing not just a third, they'll be hearing about a thirtieth of it. So you have to have all these other adjuncts. One of the things we do is we have tear sheets where we kind of mark off what we want them to use. And I've been pushing tear sheets for use in dentistry. Now we have people like certain companies, like uh, Claire has a tear sheet, uh, ProBio has a tear sheet, where you can ask you, you have it in writing. Even other companies like Hyperbiotics, uh, which is another probiotic company, they have a little card now. You can hand them that also describes, they walk out with written information. So when patients leave, I've covered what I needed to cover, but then I also mentioned we're going to cover this at your next operative appointment because typically for me, they'll have things to be done or, or like a sleep ring from Sleep Image. Well, like right now we're starting a study where we're doing a lot with the sleep ring in young children and doing the expansion like we used to. Here we are going back. Airway to way it was treated back in the 70s before suddenly we took a giant step backwards and that giant step backwards was based really on one faulty study so we end up having that giant step backwards and now we're going back to what we were doing but now we have better diagnostics and they were the sleep image ring so again in, in conversation with them i go from the outside in I start looking like at the masseteric muscles. I look at their mentalis. I look at lip tie, tongue tie. You know how many new patients I have come in with a horrible lip tie with a big diastema and carries on, on the primary maxillary incisors. And the parents will say, well, we try to brush their teeth. They go, well, you have a hard time doing it because you have a lip that's tied in between the two central incisors. I got great photos in my lectures. I show people, look at this. How could they possibly? Oh, by the way, how did you breastfeed your baby? Oh, I couldn't. But we saw lactation experts who sent me to a pediatric gastroenterologist for the baby. And then they took, oh my, no more lactose in my diet, no dairy in my diet. Right down the whole thing, right? Remove gluten, no improvement. Of course not. They didn't start looking at the patient outside in. You go outside in, you go in, you look at the face first, lips, everything. You go down, You get, I do all this with the parent watching me so they understand what's going on. And if they're above the age of six or seven or eight, I'm telling the kid too. They have a right to know. I'm not just talking to the parent, I'm talking to them. I ask the, the, the child all the questions. And you know, I, I, you know I, you've heard this from me before, I'll never forget that eight-year-old girl who was referred to me because she was a horrible dental patient. This girl, yeah, she just it doesn't cooperate. She gets horrible cavities. Well, number one, she had molar incisor hypermineralization. None of that was her fault. That's a genetic condition. She had kissing tonsils. Brodsky four tonsils. I asked her very nicely. I said, how do you eat? Do you have a hard time eating? Yes. You gag on food like once a day, every day. I said, I'm sorry about that. That's, that's not good. She goes, Dr. Cannon, I'll never forget this. She said this, Dr. Cannon, I gag on water. And I said, thank you. I've heard enough. I go out and I, the dad did not come back. I brought the dad back. I sat down with him saying, we're going to have this nice little chat. And your daughter's going to see your nose and throat. Because she's 
eight years old and she has giant tonsils and she can't breathe and that's changing her microbiome. And none of this is her fault about the cavities. I said, I'm going to put in my Google, my rook station, molar incisor hypomineralization. I'm going to show you a picture. Shh, up, we show pictures right there. I said, that's your daughter. I'm showing you a picture of your daughter right here on the screen. See those molars? That's why her molars are broken down like that. It's genetic. He goes, oh. And the little girl said, yeah, dad's been yelling at me about my tooth brushing. I go, I, I, you know. he goes, so thank you, Dr. Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a recording of that. In your face, dad. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, dad can't look to me like, Arr. but you know what? I don't care. They got the tonsils out. And in one of my lectures, I show the pictures of them because the uh, ENT shot pictures of those giant golf balls. And he said, this girl was having apparent life-threatening events at night. She could choke to death easily. Every time she had a dental procedure done, she was being waterboarded because she couldn't breathe. I mean, think about it. How cruel. Mm -hmm. And of course, a big change in her microbiome, which also changed her gut microbiome, which also makes her more ang anxious. So you have this whole thing. ADHD so please, comes in. Yeah, you have everything come in, especially anxiety, depression in girls. ADHD is a little bit more prominent in males. And, and so I, I know you're not supposed to talk about a difference in males and females, but there's a huge difference in responses to various things. Women have a vastly better immune system than males. And that's documented, scientific fact. And they need it because female, the species, is essential for survival. Guys are just, you know, we're, we're around. disposable, we're expendable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, not necessary. I'm just sitting just over nice here with a big old smile work. on my face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the power of women. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So anyway, that's the story there. That's so, a great yeah, that's story. That's why I spent... And that's so similar, and I know so many people have already heard my my son's story, and but his is very similar to that. And I went to being so holistic minded, and this started when he was very young. I went to multiple pediatric physicians, functional medicine physicians. Had you know they like, he's not going to thrive without ADHD medications. I went to finally I went to a child psychiatrist because I just needed her to tell me. No, he does not have ADHD. This is what it is. No one gave me answers that didn't require medication. And it was one of my dentists, Dr. Jeff Booski. Fast forward, I wasn't working with him at the time, but fast forward a few years that was like, look at his tonsils. And mm -hmm. he had exercise-induced asthma. No, he didn't. Yep. No, he did. I mean, he did. Yeah, that's what they call yep. it because that's a microbiome shift. Yep. And everyone now knows that that is actually a result of gut microbiome, the gut microbes being actually in the lung and the pulmonary tissue because of regurgitation, which happens all the time when you have airway issues. So yeah, it's all it, it's all one body. You know, and how you breathe is so important to mental development. You got the famous David Gozell's uh, studies if you don't fix these airway problem, you have neurocognitive changes that don't go away. You got to fix it by age six, seven. So when the pediatricians keep telling these parents to ignore and don't worry, they'll grow out of it. With males, that doesn't happen. With males, they always have a decrease in their possibility. It's called the suppression or robbing of excellence. It's a term you hear all the time where there are people who have chronic airway issues, males, end up have different symptomology than females, that will end up having a decrease in their IQ from maybe 110 to let's say 102. So it doesn't really show strongly until you de really dive deep into the epidemiology and really do these really great data dives that they're doing now into the, the issue with the suppression of excellence, the robbing of excellence. And this is something that I find terrifying because this, the research shows that's where we're heading by all this. And, and of course, like I said, airway problems have been made worse because of mask wear. Thank God the kids are getting out of masks now because uh, research, we promise to talk about research. Right now we're finishing up, hopefully soon, we're supposed to be done with it, our deep sequencing whole genome deep sequencing of the normal nasal microbiome that has never been done. 
Share more. All right, here. Please. You're supposed to hold your breath. You're supposed to say, what? Now, I'm in the Department of Otolaryngology at Northwestern. So I was digging through all the information. I could find deep sequencing done on a few pathology patients, chronic rhinosinusitis situations, cleft lip and palate patients. No one had looked at what the normal nasal gateway microbiome is. Sure, they had genus, phyla and genuses uh, in some species. That's nothing. Like I've often said, when someone gives me a, a species or a genus, let's say a genus, like let's say um, those are uh, streptococcus. I go, oh, great. That's like saying you had protein for breakfast. It means absolutely nothing. There are species that are beneficial and species that are not beneficial. There are strains that are vicious and strains that are protective. So you need to have the deep sequencing. You have to go down. Now, the funny story about that is our uh, uh, bioinformatics guy told me a couple of weekends ago, he says, I'm almost done, but running the AI to get all the information crashed Northwestern's uh, research servers again. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to have a immense. Uh, so that's one way we're going because I needed to get that done. That was a, a major thing for me to get done. And so young, healthy people without medication, no allergies, nothing. That's what we're looking at. If you don't know what's normal, Andrew, how do you know what's abnormal? Exactly. exactly. You have to know what's normal. I mean, it's, it's a plain thing. Now with the mice study, because I know we got only a few minutes left. Um, by the way, one of the things I'm going to be doing is I'm trying to try to raise more research funds. I'm running out of money fast. So we do have a, a donation available that you can actually make to the Northwest. It's the Northwest University Research Fund called the Swanson Fund. And so I've been contacting people say, hey, please donate because I'm burning through money. And I'm burning through money because we're doing another. We keep going with the mice. We have these humanized mice. And I always have to tell a story about that. And my, one of my daughters said, dad, you're working with animals and you guys have these mice and they're humanized mice, TH1, TH2 mice. And got to look at how they respond to these different cancer cell lines. Uh, right now, a lot with malignant melanoma is, is a very vicious one that's almost universally fatal in humans. And then ten, five minutes later, maybe I hear her talking to my son-in-law, her husband, about putting some traps in the garage for mice. <laughs> I go, well, listen, those poor wild mice coming in to stay warm in Minneapolis. I, I, I feel sorry for those guys because they're going to have a bad way of going. But with our mice, they're kept completely comfortable the whole time. There's no discomfort. But we did do, since the last talk, we have done the mini osmotic pumps and our results are even better before with inhibition of cancer cells. Um, and again, this is a prebiotic. This is xylitol within our mini osmotic pumps, giving a constant flow of xylitol and the growth significantly reduced. It's a very significant difference. And now we're going to be doing another group soon. And once I get some more money with combining it with uh, common, normal chemotherapy indications and also combining it with the new immunotherapy. We have two sets of mice for that. But we're doing the histology right now, how it prevents angiogenesis, how it prevents the growth. So here we go. Here we got something we use in the mouth all the time, xylitol, right? We use it all the time in the mouth. We know it inhibits oral cancer cell lines. That's well published. You're not just treating gum disease. You're not just treating cavities. You're not just reducing Alzheimer's. You're not just reducing atherosclerosis. You're not just reducing diabetes and obesity. You're also affecting the metabolomics and, you know, it's always, every time you bring up metabolism, you have the people who are against it. So actually, because I'm part of the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Research Center, we have some people, I'm an associate investigator. We have people who are really cynics. When you convince the cynics, they're looking at saying, you've got something. How important, we don't know. But the big, beautiful part about it is with this prebiotic with xylitol, there's no side effects. And we do know the mechanisms is that it reduces the ability of the cancer cell to defend itself from ROSs, the reactive oxidative species. So that means if you do radiation and you have xylitol on board, 
The radiation is going to be vastly more effective. You can reduce the dosages. You can reduce the dosages of the chemo. This is something that's very important. I mean, half of people now are passing from cancer. We all know friends who've passed from cancer. So what this is doing is bringing medicine and dentistry even closer together. Because we have to realize everything we do in the oral cavity has an effect, positive or negative, on the body. If we use chlorhexidine, you mentioned that before, you raise blood pressure. That's a negative effect on the body. You use other methods, like there's probiotic mouth rinses, no raise in blood pressure. In fact, you might actually encourage the nitrate-reducing bacteria if you have some prebiotics in it. So, you know, you talk about functional medicine, we should all be functional. Mm-hmm. It's better than being dysfunctional. So true. <laughs> You're amazing, Dr. Cannon, and you really, I know I say this every time I'm around you, but you are making our world better, and in a very sick world that we have, and I love that, you know, often experts get asked, where do you start, and it's always somewhere really complicated, and yours isn't complicated at all. It's exactly where it needs to start. It's all about education. And yes, education and looking at the patient. Yes, yes. I love Just look at the patient. A lot of times you can, you don't, I don't know if you saw this at the midwinter meeting. Did you see the big sign, the big banner they had where they said, uh, bargains, brews and shopping or something like that deals. Remember that big sign they had? I don't remember that one. And there was a young lady with a mask on serving a beer. Did you look at her eyes? She had a mask on. You could tell she had airway issues. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't. Un- With a mask on, you can look right at her and go like, I said, how many thousands of dentists walked past her and didn't see that she had a severe airway issue? Do you know, that's so true. <laughs> and once you learn it, you can't, you can't unsee it, right? And you can't unsee my, it. And, I have permission to talk this. My amazing boyfriend has two incredible young sons, nine and 12 years old. And my first pictures of these sweet boys, and I love them with everything in me, was one of, oh my gosh, they look so sweet and they have airway issues. And you can tell that they're both mouth breathers. And you know what's so sad about it is... Neil has been, uh, preventative is very important to him. And these sweet boys, every six months since they were babies, they have gone in to their dental visits. And yeah. not one time until this crazy blonde from Texas st- starts dating, he starts dating her, which. Who was that, that? I don't know. I don't know. You all know me, so you're there's, giggling. There's crazy blondes in Texas? <laughs> I never Just heard that one. before. Just the one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, his sweet boy is that's, it's being addressed now. And I see those dark circles under his eyes going away. Yeah. And, um, and I love that. Yeah. I work on that. I got, I got my four year olds. I'm doing expanders on, which we have done since the seventies. Wow. But it, we got, we, everyone went after it. I mean, we, we had a lot of criticism in the eight, late eighties, early nineties. A lot of pediatric dentists stopped doing it because they just don't, didn't want to be unpopular. So just extract those yeah. permanent teeth and create a bigger problem. Yeah, is, well, no one's doing that thankfully. anymore, but they're still retracting. That's true. They're, they're, still, they're still expanding at the same time they expand. They pull all those incisors back. You go, please don't do that. I mean, you know, so what if we have to do a little bonding? Mm-hmm. I tell the parents all the time. Do a little bonding. You know, if you have small teeth, you you fill the gaps by making the teeth the right size to begin with. Yeah. Thank God we have bonding, right? That's right. Hey, thank God we guys, have you. Thank you so much. Let's go there. Thank ah. goodness we have you. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, this is a tale. A tale, oh yeah. A tale of two hygienists. So there might be only one. Bringing the best of dental knowledge. And we do it all with ease. We cover oral health and screening and preventing gum disease. We're going to do a lot of learning and have a little bit of fun working at the dentist. A tale of two hygienists.